video and welcome back to Equity Tutors. Um, so we have covered over the past few weeks what will be for most of you the first two modules of your A-level or AS, so the first year of your A-levels. And as we've mentioned, we've been trying to cover the specifics for everyone's specification, everyone's syllabus. But now that we are in the last two lessons of this year before we go on Christmas break, we wanted to focus more in the next couple of weeks on topics that we may have left out from certain syllabuses, which maybe weren't for everyone. So we're going to do specific lessons on them now. So today I'm going to be starting with some more detailed information on viruses and this applies to people studying the exam board edXL B only. So if you are not studying under the edXL B exam board you do not need to know this information and so you don't need to listen. For everyone who's on edXL B as I said you need to know a little bit more information about viruses than other people do. So since I'm being specific to you today I can be specific to your learning outcomes. So I'm going to start with what the learning outcomes are. So firstly you need to understand the classification of viruses. Secondly you need to know the lytic cycle of a virus. So how does the virus actually infect cells and, and eventually kill cells. You need to know that viruses are not living cells and possible ways that we can treat viral infections. And finally, you know, need to know an example of a viral outbreak and they want you to learn about the example of Ebola and then understand what happened during Ebola and maybe some of the ethical implications of using novel drugs and novel therapeutics during this time. What's really good for you in a post-pandemic world is that you probably have got more understanding of viruses, viral infections, ethical um, considerations around new viruses during a pandemic than you ever did before, than previous students had. So um, I'm hoping that uh, it'll be easier for you to understand than it would have before the pandemic. Okay, so we are going to start with what are viruses? So you've covered the uh, what they are and the structure with Lauren but um, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about how they work. So just as a recap, viruses are non-living structures which consist of a nucleic acid, so that's a DNA or an RNA, enclosed in a protective protein coat called a capsid. Sometimes they're covered with a, a lipid layer called an envelope but not always and just to reiterate they are non-living. So they cannot survive on their own. They need to hijack other cells to survive. So as I said, they are, consist of a nucleic acid. So these, this can be either a DNA or an RNA. And your first learning outcome is that you need to understand that viruses can be classified based on the structure and type of nucle nucleic acid that's inside the capsid. And... Um, you need to know there are three types and you need to know examples of these three types. So the first type is a DNA virus, which of course features a DNA as its nucleic acid. And the example you need to know is a lambda phage virus. And in terms of what else you need to know about new, uh, DNA viruses, um, so they can act directly as a template for our mRNA transcription DNA replication and they have a geometric shape. The other two are types of RNA viruses. So you have an RNA virus, an, a normal RNA virus, and the example you need to know here is either Ebola or tobacco mosaic virus. And then you also have RNA retroviruses. And the example you need to know here is HIV. So these are single strands of RNA, and they use reverse transcriptase enzyme to produce cDNA from an RNA template. So this is in contrast to a, DNA, a double stranded or DNA virus which will integrate itself into the host's genome. So you can understand if you have a strand of RNA, strand of DNA, how the mechanics of how they will take over the DNA replication and transcription machinery may be a little different. You don't need to know details of that. You just need to know that in a DNA virus it can act directly as a template and it, you can do normal transcription based on that template, 
normal replication based on that template. A little bit different to the RNA viruses and they use reverse transcriptase enzyme to produce a cDNA which stands for complementary DNA from an RNA template. And there are some differences between the two types of RNA um, viruses. So between an RNA virus and a retrovirus or between Ebola and HIV. So for example, the tobacco mosaic virus, this is a normal RNA virus, contains ssRNA. And this can be directly translated into proteins by the ribosomes. Whereas Ebola contains negative ssRNA, which needs to be transcribed to produce mRNA before translation. So the RNA virus can be directly translated, but the retrovirus needs to be transcribed, needs to go through transcription before translation. Okay, so now moving on to your second learning outcome, which is to know the lytic cycle of a virus and latency. So I'm just going to talk through how viruses actually infect cells. So the the, the the molecular basis of that. How do they attach to cells? How do they get in? And then how do they kill the cell? So as I said, viruses do not undergo cell division. Instead, they infect a host cell and use the host cell to replicate themselves, as I just described in those different, depending on the type of virus there is. And therefore, the virus's life cycle depends on its ability to successfully infect a host cell so that it may produce. So when we talk about a virus's life cycle, we're talking about at what stage relative to another cell, basically, it's in. So whether it's infecting the cell, whether, whether it's replicating, or whether it's in, like, for example, the cause the cell to lies and it's towards the end of its life cycle. So step one is that the virus binds to host cells. So it binds to a host cell using attachment proteins on the outside of the capsid. Again, I'm going to relate this to COVID and say you may have heard of the spike protein when we talk about COVID. That is a protein on the outside of the virus that's used to attach to the cells. So, and this means that different viruses are able to infect different cells. So, for example, why COVID will infect our airway, so our lungs, but doesn't infect, for example, our skin. Um, and that is because the proteins on the surface of the virus will determine which cells it can, inf in, can infect. The HIV virus, for example, has attachment proteins which bind to T cells, which is why it affects the immune system. So the next thing that happens is that it injects nucleic acids. So they inject the nucleic acids into the host cell. So remember that viruses have either DNA or RNA-based genomes, and once the attachment protein to a virus attached to the host cell, the virus latches on and injects the cell with either their DNA or RNA. And we call this part of the viral cycle the lysogenic cycle. So the time where the virus is injecting its nucleic acid into the host cell. So the next step, it injects its unique viral proteins. So certain viruses can also inject different proteins into the host cell. So these proteins are things that are going to help the virus hijack the cell's machinery. So remember, what the virus wants to do is to replicate and transcribe its proteins. So these proteins will help so to fight off any of any proteins that may be competing, any proteins from the host cell that may be competing with the virus to replicate and transcribe proteins. So in this process, the virus essentially forces the cell to give up on making its own proteins and replicates its own, own DNA and instead focus all its energy into re replicating the viral genome. Obviously, this isn't very good for the cells and the cells become very sick. And then step number four is release from the host cell. So once the host cell's pr produced and replicated the virus sufficiently, the viral particles will burst through the cell through a po process called lytic release. And once they burst through the cell, the viruses will go on to affect other host cells. So imagine the virus has infected the cells, replicated, 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 caused the cell to burst, and then what's happened is all of those extra copies of the virus are then free to infect all the adjacent cell cells. And then the final step is that the host cell dies. 
So for obvious reasons, the cells burst open and it can no longer function, so it dies. And this, pro this part of the cycle is called the lytic cycle. And then finally, in this learning outcome, the final thing you need to know about is latency. So viruses can become latent during the lysogenic part of the reproduction cycle. So it can become dormant. So essentially, it's infected a cell, but it hasn't started to, it hasn't caused the cell to become sick yet. So this can result in, for example, in a person who's infected with the virus but is asymptomatic. Um, another example, real life example, is uh, HIV, where you hear that people still have HIV but it's dormant. So they're undetectable, but they are still infected with HIV. It means that they can't spread the HIV, means they have no symptoms of being infected with HIV because the virus is latent. So it's no longer reproducing within the cells. But the virus can become reactivated at some point in the future. This could be due to a number of factors, things like stress. If you think about uh, where you have cold sores, so that is caused by a virus um, which will sit latent inside your cells, then maybe if you, if you are going through a stressful time, people will often say that they can have an outbreak of cold sores. So that is another example of um, viruses laying dormant or latent in cells. So just to recap, lysogenic viruses or viruses in the lysogenic cycle into DNA or RNA in the form of a provirus into the DNA of the host cell, which enables viral DNA or RNA to be replicated using the host cell's machinery. And it's in this stage or these types of viruses which can result in a latency of viruses, so where they can stay dormant within the host cell and sometimes this is also because of repressor proteins which inhibit the transcription of the virus which has been infected. Lytic viruses then will cause lysis of the whole cell when a large number of viruses have been, been replicated within that cell. They're assembled and it, the cell bursts open and the virus is ready to infect more cells. And then finally, when a lysogenic host cell becomes damaged by the immune or damaged by the immune system or the body is weakened dormant viruses can move from the lysogenic cycle to the lytic cycle so from a lysogenic virus to a lytic virus which can then again lead to lysis of the cell and spread of that original latent infection so the next thing i want to talk about is um, how antivirals might work so because viruses are very simple organisms, um, they can't actually like survive on their own. They don't have any unique metabolism because all they hijack whatever the host is. They're very diff difficult to treat. And the way the most antivirals work is by either preventing entry into the host cell to begin with, or we then try and prevent the DNA replication once it's inside the host cell. Now, with that in mind, we are now going to talk about the Ebola outbreak. And specifically relating to the Ebola outbreak, you need to know how it can be difficult to treat once an infection has occurred. And because it's so difficult to treat, the shift often goes to prevention of infection. Again, something that you'll be very familiar with now. And also the ethical implications during an outbreak like Ebola about using novel therapeutics, so new drugs that are untested. What are the ethical implications of using drugs that have never been tested before in a new outbreak which is potentially deadly? So just a little bit of background on Ebola. So it was a virus that spread rapidly through the areas of West Africa in 2014 and generally speaking there was very poor hygiene in the area. It resulted in almost 5,000 deaths, there was no effective vaccine and so disease control measures were generally aimed to reduce spread. So when I say about reducing spread, again this would be something you are familiar with, Things like quarantine for people who are positive for Ebola virus, sterilization of equipment, protective clothing, PPE, so people using masks and gloves, 
and scrubs, especially for the doctors treating these patients to try and stop spread between different people. Um, you also have obviously quick testing. That was another thing you can relate to COVID. So rapid identification and testing of the individuals who came in contact with the disease. So remember track and trace and then reducing person to person contact with the virus. So that is relate that to lockdowns. So generally reducing how much interaction is occurring between people. So now talking about the specific treatments and vaccines that came about during this time. So as you can imagine, this was a very deadly virus. It was more deadly than coronavirus. And people were desperate for any sort of treatment um, or vaccine to help reduce the spread and then help, well, number one, reduce the spread and number two, to treat the people already infected. So new drugs were needed very quickly and some vaccines were made on a, on a super fast tracked route. For example, an exper experimental drug, ZMAP, was given to some people and it had never been given to humans before. And there was one particular vaccine which had never been given before to patients. And because it had passed an early clinical trial, was fast-tracked to try out in the Ebola outbreak, it was given to seven people. And some of the seven people recovered, but some of them actually died. So we want to use this example of this fast-tracked drug to discuss and consider the ethical implications of using or not using these types of untested drugs. So when in a situation like this where patients are severely ill, so I would advise, this is an ethical discussion, so I would advise you need to put yourself in those shoes. So you have be, you've been infected with Ebola and let's say, for example, the advice is or doctors think that you are more than likely it is going to be fatal. So you're more than likely going to die from this infection. And you have a known treatment which will maybe save 10% of people and an, a new unknown drug which is has been promising in early stages of clinical trials maybe in animals but hasn't been tested in humans with an unknown outcome so think about the things that you would weigh up if you personally were trying to decide do I go for the known 10% possible survival or an unknown drug so the things that you might consider so number one there may be unanticipated severe side effects and those side effects could be contraindications with other medications you are taking they could be depending on if you're a male or a female they could be severe for everyone across the board you know if, if there's five percent of people get heart attacks as a result of this treatment which may not have come up in earlier clinical trials because earlier clinical trials tend to be very small these are all things that you need to consider you also need to weigh up whether the taking the unknown treatment actually may have a worse outcome than the guaranteed, for example, 10% known good outcome. So how effective are the other available treatments? And then think about it from then the doctor's point of view. Number one, if you have a limited amount of this drug, how do you decide which individuals do you treat first? Do you treat the most sick patients who are most likely to to die otherwise or do you treat the patients who are better who could who are a little healthier who may tolerate more side effects there's also then the issue possibly of you giving this treatment patient dying anyway and you don't know whether or not that was attributable to the drug or was probably going to happen anyway and then finally probably the most complicated is the fact that severely ill patients cannot give informed consent. So imagine, for example, during COVID where patients are incubated, so they're not conscious, if a magic cure came along 
and they had there was a drug and there was a 50 50 percent chance of them getting off the incubator unfortunately the patient in that situation is unable to make the decision themselves so there is no informed consent and again i urge you to think yourself if you were in that situation how would you like to be treated so that is all for the extra virus lessons for the edxl b students as i said there's going to be next week will be a similar structure and lauren's going to be covering a couple of other things specific to specific exam boards which um, have not been covered in the other lessons so thank you so much for listening remember you can access additional content on our patreon page by searching for equity tutors where we have a second 30 minute lesson every week plus monthly bonus content you can also find us on most social media platforms we will keep you updated on new content and you can find us there by searching for equity tutors uk Please like, share, subscribe and comment wherever you are listening. And if you're enjoying, please leave a review. Bye. Bye.